Good afternoon. Welcome to the Sirius Weekly Seminar. Today, we're excited to welcome Cindy Shen. Uh, Dr. Shen is a professor of communication at UC Davis. Her research focuses on understanding visual misinformation. Today, Cindy's talk is titled, A Fake Image is Worth a Thousand Lies. Cindy, thank you for joining us. Please take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Mike, uh, for this very generous introduction and for uh, inviting me to share my work with all of you today at the Sirius Talk Series. All right, so let me introduce the backdrop of the research presented here. Um, I, I'm sure some of you have heard um, the term fake news. Uh, so in 2018, the journal Science published a review piece which seems to suggest that the study of fake news or misinformation has entered into prominence. In this piece, they gave a formal definition of fake news. So the term fake news, uh, as I'm sure some of you know, was populated by the presidential candidate, Donald Trump. Um, so this, this phrase fake news has entered into public vocabulary, right? So we could casually refer to misinformation as fake news. It can be understood as fabricated information that mimics news media content in form, but not in organizational process or intent. And fake news outlets in turn lack the news media's editorial norms and processes for ensuring the accuracy and credibility of information. But at the same time, the term fake news carries political bias, as Trump himself repeatedly used fake news to describe anything that does not uh, support his agenda, right? So in this infamous tweet, he slammed reputable news outlets such as New York Times as fake news, obviously in an attempt to use fake news as a political weapon. Uh, another example is this tweet uh, where I think it's uh, leading up to the 2020 election, he claimed that the poll to be fake because it shows he was losing in Pennsylvania. So anything that is against his agenda was you know, termed as fake news um, so that the, the trust or credibility of that news source is damaged. For these reasons, um, the scholarly community tend to think that fake news itself is not a, like a very academic or neutral term. Instead, they prefer to use misinformation, which describes false or misleading information. And another term is disinformation, which describes false information that is purposely spread to deceive people. Now, I mentioned the distinction between misinformation and disinformation because this distinction sometimes comes up a lot when we talk about visual misinformation, which, which we'll cover later in this talk. And I sometimes get asked, you know, which is worse? Is, it, is misinformation worse or is disinformation worse? Which one is the bigger threat to our society? My answer to this is that they both are. Of course, uh, intent is important, but once misinformation enters into our information ecosystem, everybody loses because we now bear a much bigger cost uh, to our information verification. Our trust of information is compromised as a result. Now we have to carefully verify everything, right? And in this process, truth becomes collateral damage. And I probably do not have to preach to this crowd how detrimental misinformation can be. It damages our trust in public institutions. It threatens democracy and it literally kills people, right? And we also should add the compounding effect from online networks. And research has shown that false information on Twitter is retweeted by more people and far more rapidly than true information, especially uh, for politics. So most existing work on misinformation focuses on textual misinformation. But we all know that's not how people consume information these days. Uh, people increasingly consume information in a multimodal format. So the motivation of my line of work is really simple. I want to know how people process visual misinformation. And decades of research has shown us that users process and perceive visuals fundamentally different than text. Uh, visuals are more easily recalled, uh, shared, and are more of, uh, often more persuasive 
than words. So uh, we hear the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Which describe exactly that. And I think in the context of misinformation, the opposite also holds true. Hence my title, a fake image is worth a thousand lies. Now images historically have been perceived as photographic proof of the depicted events. Uh, we have expressions such as seeing is believing because photographs are convincing proof of things that happened or may be happening. It, an example of this is the moon landing, right? The only way we knew it happened is the photographic evidence like this one. Otherwise, how did you know that it happened, right? You don't because nobody was there physically, right? Eyewitnessing uh, when it happened. So the only proof we have is the visual um, evidence, the footages, the pictures, and so on. However, while in image manipulation technology could be used effectively, with modern technology, it's getting much easier to deceive and manipulate viewers uh, using forgeries. And these fake images can change beliefs, cause distrust, or manipulate emotions. Here, I present you an example of this. This is from the 2004 uh, US presidential election, where an image of the presidential nominee John Kerry on the left um, was circulating on the media. He was sharing the stage with activist Jane Fonda on the right at the Vietnam era anti-war rally back in the 70s. Now, regardless of your political opinion on this picture, um, this picture showed contrary to the image Kerry wanted to present at that time, okay? So this picture was very damaging to his political career. But this image was a composition and a visual forgery uh, by a Bush supporter. The forgery was exposed because the two originals were found in archival sources. But by the time the forgery was uncovered, this image, was circulating a lot and even appeared on New York Times. We all know that when New York Times runs a retraction, the story may not be viewed as widely as the original was, right? So the damage had already been done. The point is human beings just simply lack the ability and the technical tools to tell the fake from the real images. Even big media outlets such as New York Times will fall for it. So with the wide availability of advanced photo editing tools, we can no longer ensure that photographic records accurately reflect reality. Fake images can be extremely harmful and we have very few tools at our disposal. Here, I wanna show you another example of a composition work. The image display here um, of bikini wearing rifle toting Sarah Palin. Uh, Sarah Palin was the 2008 Republican um, vice president nominee. So as the nomination was uh, announced, this photo was circulating on the internet, but it was purely a digital manipulation. It was created by pasting an image of her head onto the original photo of a bikini clad woman holding a BB gun, actually not a rifle. Sometimes even journalists at the big media outlets would commit photo manipulation knowingly as well. Uh, so the economist, a very reputable magazine ran a cover photo of President Obama on the Louisiana beach. This was around um, the BP oil spill incident in 2010. But the original photo shows that Obama was in fact not alone at all, right? So the altered image cropped out to other people, okay? Um, we can debate of, you know, whether this should be done, should not be done, but uh, the fact is that it was a photo manipulation to eliminate certain elements of the original image. And sometimes a fake image does not necessarily involve deliberate manipulation of the image itself. Uh, it involves mismatching the image and the context is supposed to describe. I don't know how many of you have seen this video of Biden speaking at an event uh, in Iowa earlier this year. Um, this video and you know, the, the tweet quickly went viral with the caption, bird poops on Joe Biden. Do you know that this caption is actually wrong? 
In fact, Biden was speaking in an indoor event. So it's extremely unlikely for a bird to come swooping in and you know, drop on Biden. Instead, Biden was standing right next to a giant pile of processed corn. Okay, it's a corn product called the DDGS. In fact, photographs from the event show that the corn was actively falling on this pile during his speech. And there are many eyewitnesses too. For example, um, the agricultural news website AG Wired reported that you know, the CEO Jeff Cooper was an eyewitness in the distiller's grain barn with Biden. And he confirmed it was definitely DDGS responsible for spotting the CODIS level, not bird dropping. A similar example is this one um, circulated around during Hurricane Sandy at New York, New York City some years ago. In this photo, Lady Liberty looks like she's under attack from Sandy's massive storm surge, but really this is from the movie The Day After Tomorrow. So the photo itself was not manipulated, but it was used purposefully in the wrong context. And that's misinformation too. Um, and lastly, internet memes, right? Internet memes often fall into the category of misinformation as well. Uh, in this example, the photo of Einstein is real, but the quote was not. So again, using a real and authentic image in the wrong context, it creates visual misinformation. So after so many examples, uh, my point being image veracity is contextual. Images or videos or other multimodal information has to be judged within a context. And there are many types of visual misinformation. Some involved manipulated images, but some involve perfectly authentic images placed in a wrong context. Uh, and how do we define them? So we did a comprehensive review. And then we identified four ways uh, we can create fake images or visual misinformation. The first is composition. It means putting two photos together, maybe pasting one person's head onto another, like the Sarah Palin case. Retouching means changing specific elements in the existing image. For example, someone might be holding a water cannon, and then you can retouch it to make it look like a gun, right? Elimination is about cropping out certain parts of the image, like the Obama example. And the lastly, misattribution is um, putting an image or video in the wrong context. But the image or video itself doesn't have to be edited, right? So the Biden example, the internet meme example, they all fall into misattribution. Okay, now we have defined fake or forged images. The next question is uh, whether we as human beings are able to detect it. Now let's go back to the moon landing picture. How do we know it's real or fake? Well, unfortunately, we don't. Because the technology that allows for creating manipulated images has far outpaced technological methods for detecting such manipulations. But there are some analysis methods that could detect forgeries from looking into the metadata uh, looking into encryption, or in this method developed by my collaborators in computer graphics by analyzing shadows and perspectives. Without going into too much technical detail, this analysis shows that moon landing did actually happen. But these methods are very complex and they're not accessible to the average internet user. In fact, the average internet users often assume they have the ability to identify forgeries, but they're often wrong, okay? Um, this is an infamous example here. In 2016, Mike Pence posted this image on Twitter taken, uh, I think, at a Chili's restaurant with his wife, who's dressed in black, and his daughter, who's dressed in white. If I ask you to look at the image very closely, do you think this image is real or fake? Can you spot anything wrong with it? Okay, many internet users did claim that something was very wrong. They immediately created a buzz to say that the image is fake because while Pence had a reflection in the mirror, his daughter didn't. How could that be? How could that be? Some Twitter users started calling her a vampire. 
However, <laughs> as you can see in this analysis, that the fact that her reflection is not apparent in the mirror is actually consistent with the geometry of the scene uh, through analyzing reflection, how reflection behaves under perspective projection. Right? If we apply mass, you can see that the tip of her nose should be behind pants. That's why we don't see her reflection in the mirror because her reflection was blocked by Pence's reflection. So even when there's a growing awareness that images no longer represent an authentic proof of reality, we're not very good at finding the manipulations and therefore we are very vulnerable to them. Okay, so now I have explained the rationale. Next, uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about a series of empirical studies carried out at my lab funded by the National Science Foundation and by the Facebook Integrity Research Award. We began by doing a focus group study, which was published um, in the proceeding of CHI in 2018. And that study uh, aimed to answer one question, how do people evaluate image credibility? So we created lots of uh, fake images using the you know, four categories. We just identified composition, elimination, retouching, and misattribution. And then we created lots of mockups uh, based on these images, so these mockups have the medium, uh, it purportedly can be from Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, and then it has an outlet, let's say some of the images are from BBC, some are from New York Times, etc. And we also create a very, very short caption um, and some endorsement cues. So this is an example of one of the mockups here. Um, this visual post purportedly is from Facebook, it was published by uh, the account of BBC World News, it has a one line uh, caption and 439 people shared it, et cetera. To make it look like uh, the way it should be when you encounter uh, the image online. And we conducted the study at two locations and our findings. Uh, we found that our participants uh, made judgments mostly based on non-image cues. So in other words, um, when we show this mock-up to participants, they may tell us this is real or fake. are very poor at identifying fake images. So that's the first study. Uh, naturally, we did a second study um, following our first study. And in this study, we ran a large scale experiment um, to see what factors predict people's credibility judgments of online images. And we borrowed heavily from credibility research in other settings and extend them into the image context. Um, so I'll, I'll go through all these factors we tested. We looked at the source. Um, we used some very highly trustworthy source and some you know, kind of sketchy sources. We used humans as sources. We also used the media organization, such as New York Times or BuzzFeed as sources. We looked at the source and media type. Uh, is it website or social media, or is it news organization versus individuals? Uh, we looked at something called intermediaries. And this is something I think that's very unique to social media platforms. Uh, let's say in this example, um, the, the original source was this Japanese guy, uh, Yusaku Maziwa on Twitter, right? But we actually don't really personally know this person. I never heard of him. But the fact that Elon Musk liked this tweet tells us something. So in this case, we are only able to access this tweet or know about this tweet due to uh, this being liked or retweeted by Elon Musk. So in this case, Elon Musk is the intermediary source. And then uh, Yusaku uh, himself is the original source. So we're interested in learning whether the intermediary the endorsement from someone else would have any impact on the perceived credibility and what happens when the credibility of the source and the credibility of the intermediary are at odds with each other. 
Also, uh, we looked at the social buttons uh, like like share, favorite, etc. They're available on websites, um, and then um, research has shown that uh, there is something called the bandwagon effect, where people are more likely to agree with a perceived consensus from aggregate metrics, such as, oh, so many people have liked it, then it must be true, something like that. And we expect the same heuristic for online images. Um, we also looked at people's digital media literacy, uh, such as their photography skills, their internet skills, your social media experience. And finally, confirmation bias is a well-established finding in the context of credibility judgment in that people are more likely to perceive something as credible if it confirms their existing beliefs and opinions. All right, so we did an experimental design um, with 28 conditions, six images, uh, 28 mockups for each image. So that's a lot of conditions. Okay, so this is uh, briefly what we tested. Uh, here are some example mockups. Um, here is a mockup for a, a Facebook post allegedly created by Bill Gates, and then it was shared by NPR. Right? So Bill Gates will be the original source and NPR will be the intermediary source. And this image was modified to display airstrikes in Syria. So as you can see, the mockup you know, tries really hard to simulate the environment in which you encounter uh, visual information on, on social media sites. Uh, here's an, another example. Um, this is a Facebook post allegedly created by BuzzFeed and shared by a generic person, Mark Smith. Um, uh, supposedly, it depicts a school in Africa. Here's another one, um, a Facebook post allegedly created by BuzzFeed and showing, um, showing uh, it, it's like an animal uh, creation in the lab. Uh, here's another example. As you can see, I mean, the Photoshop job we did is, you know, with varying degree of success, we would say, and we did it deliberately so that it's not like perfect Photoshop job. I, I would say that if you look very closely, you can kind of see that the Photoshop job was not nicely done and that was intentional. Okay, so we looked, uh, we used uh, MTurkers in the United States, asking them to use your desktop. Uh, and we also did an skewed example for comparison, our findings. We found no effects for source trustworthiness, source media type, or intermediary, or bandwagon. What does have an effect are two things. First is people's digital media literacy. So if they have more experience doing digital photography, if they uh, have higher internet skills, then they are more likely to be skeptical of the fake images. Um, another thing that mattered is people's issue attitudes. So if they already kind of agree with whatever is depicting in the image post, then they are more likely to think this is credible. Okay, so to affirm whatever their prior attitude regarding an issue. So with all these findings um, that led us to think, well, people seem to be pretty terrible. <laughs> um, at uh, judging the credibility of visual misinformation. But what can we do to solve the misinformation problem based on findings? Uh, it seems there are two obvious choices here. Uh, one is that we could um, do something with the platforms. Uh, what if we make some tweaks to the platforms? That could help. The other option we had is, uh, what if we do something to the users, okay? What if we educate them? What if we design a low cost intervention? Okay, so these are exactly what we did in two follow up studies. So let's take a look at the next study in which we um, try to see if we can do something to the platforms. Okay, um, so it involves uh, using something called image forensic labeling. So I'm sure uh, a lot of you are somewhat familiar with fact-checking websites like Hoaxy, PolitiFact, or Snopes, right? Uh, these are existing fact-checking services. Uh, they're mostly about textual, but uh, they start to, you know, include visual misinformation in their fact-checking services as well. The problem of these services is that you have to come to them, right? So they are a third party. 
Uh, so imagine 100 users are exposed to misinformation, let's say a fake picture. How many of them do you think would willingly go to Snopes or PolitiFact or Hoaxy and to check whether that image they just saw are authentic or not? I bet it's not 100 people, right? Actually, very few of them will willingly go to third-party websites and do the fact check themselves. Okay. Another problem with these sites is that they are after the exposure. Uh, so, in, um, so for example, you have to already see the um, visual misinformation or the image or the uh, visual post, and then you will go to a third party site such as PolitiFact to check its veracity. But by the time you arrive at PolitiFact, you kind of already form an impression about the image or video we're try you're trying to uh, check. Oh, so it's called post exposure. And post exposure is not very efficient. Okay, what if we make the platforms on which you consume information carry some of the fact checking burden? Okay, what if as you're exposed to information, to images, you can see um, a forensic label of that image at the same time? Okay, so if we do that, then it eliminates the problem of, you know, you have to have a prior exposure. And it also elim eliminates the problem that you have to seek out a third party service, right? Because here, the forensic label would be already on the platform uh, on which you're consuming news. Okay, so we call this model a concurrent model of fact checking. You make the credibility assessment as you um, are consuming the image or video. So uh, we get some inspiration from PolitiFact's uh, truth o meter okay? I think it's a very, very nice visual representation of uh, where the information uh, falls. Is it pants on fire? Is it mostly true? Is it half true, et cetera? So we designed something called a picture o meter um, So it models after truth o meter and then we put this picture meter uh, with our mockups. We did a experiment very similar to the previous one. And then um, results. It shows that the forensic labels definitely work. Okay, so the average image credibility ratings um, differ by labeling condition. The altered label, which means the image was altered, was doctored, uh, in the center, it was significantly lower in credibility than the control condition, while the unaltered label did not differ significantly from the control condition. So in other words, we uh, our default is that everything is trustworthy, okay? Everything's trustworthy. But if you actually tell them, you know, in, in terms of a label that this is altered, this is photoshopped, the credibility of that um, image is significantly lower than if it were unaltered or uh, there is no labeling at all. So labels definitely work. Um, this figure shows uh, the various factors associated with participants' perceived image credibility rating. As we would expect, um, people uh, with a certain political ideology, people with higher internet skills, and people with pro-issue attitudes are more likely to um, think of something as more trustworthy um, versus people with lower internet skills um, and photography experience. So that was consistent with our previous study as well. So basically the more experience you have, the more skeptical you become. And then uh, user features, um, yeah, participants with high digital media literacy, they were more skeptical. Uh, they're less likely to rate images as very credible. And images that aligns with participants' pre-existing issue attitude were more likely to be perceived as credible. Okay, so that's our study looking at the um, some tweaks we can do for the platforms. The last study I want to talk about um, is what if we train the users, okay? So yes, platforms, yes, we can make some tweaks, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't do anything to the users. What if we educate 
the users. So how did we do it? Um, this, this project is ongoing. Uh, it's using low cost intervention to encourage fact checking misattributed images. Uh, it was partially funded by a Facebook research award. So the inspiration of this study uh, was taken from a Twitter feature. Uh, I think Twitter started rolling out this little intervention like maybe two or three years ago. So whenever you're trying to share something, a link on Twitter, it actually asks you to read the story before sharing, okay? All it is doing is to create some kind of friction for the dissemination of information. So we thought, you know, what if we do the same for images? Um, and this applies specifically to images that are misattributed or taken out of context, right? Remember, uh, one of the categories of visual misinformation is images that are not uh, edited, but placed in a wrong context. And this can be checked by using a reverse image search, right? So there's a tool for that. So we decided to um, include like a little intervention to ask users to do a re reverse image search, okay? It will be especially useful for this particular kind of miscaptioned images, okay? So we found our stimuli by scrapping, uh, scraping this website, snopes.com. Uh, snopes.com has this very interesting category called photography, where it has a collection of dubious images of videos under false pretense. Uh, so for example, this is uh, one of our um, stimuli material we used. So this is, the, the image is the same, it hasn't been photoshopped. But in the first case, um, the caption says, buses purchased by Black Lives Matter supporters to transfer members to a riot in July, 2020, which is wrong. The caption was wrong. And in the correct condition, it said Toronto Raptors rolling to NBA bubbles in the Black Lives Matter bus in July, 2020, okay? Same image, but different captions. So we designed a tiny intervention by giving um, our participants a little infographic uh, called It's Seen Believing. And in this, we walked them through how they can use reverse image search on their desktop. Uh, we divided them into three groups. Uh, one is the active group. Uh, these people would read the infographic and they have to complete a reverse image search task, okay? And they have to pass it. The second group is the passive group in which they only read the infographic, but there is no uh, requirement for them to practice reverse image search. And the third group is the control group. Um, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't read any infographic, et cetera. So what we wanted to see is that whether the active and passive group would be better at discerning fake images than the control group. Okay, so very briefly, uh, our results is that active intervention significantly increased intention of using reverse image search tools compared to the passive and the control group but neither active or passive intervention had an effect on credibility judgment or misinformation discernment. So continuing on, uh, we are in the process of doing a follow-up study to up people's motivation even further by giving them money or um, online badges, okay? So that's kind of um, uh, what we're testing here. What if we give people more incentive for them to carry out uh, these reverse searches. Uh, would that make the results better? Um, and in order to make the experimental condition as real as possible, we hired a programmer to design a fully functional Facebook lookalike as our experimental site. Uh, everything here on the interface is clickable and it's fully functional. Uh, but that study is still ongoing I, and I don't have the results to talk about just yet. Okay, so um, as we're approaching the 40 minutes mark, uh, I want to kind of briefly summarize uh, what I shared so far, kind of all tie it together. So um, first question we discussed today is how do people judge the credibility of images, right? And then uh, the first study um, we did in our group is that uh, people are pretty bad at it. 
you know, they, they're just very vulnerable to uh, fake images. They don't really know where to look when trying to judge the um, veracity of the images. And when they do, they're often wrong. And then in this second experiment, uh, when we systematically tested everything, we found that decision of image judge, uh, credibility judgment is heavily influenced by people's digital media literacy, their political affiliation, and their prior issue attitude. So in that people are have more digital media literacy, they are you know, very proficient at, at using various apps and internet, they are much more skeptical than people who are not as well um, prepared. And the second question we're trying to tackle is what can we do given these findings, okay? So again, I shared two studies. Um, the third study, it focuses on what the platforms can do, right? So we uh, tested a, a forensic label of images on these platforms. And it turns out the credibility, the forensic labels do work, okay? Uh, people who are shown uh, the photoshopped label and they would rate the images as significantly less credible than people in other conditions. Uh, but is there anything else we can do to the users? So here in the fourth study I shared, um, we designed a low cost intervention that teaches people how to do reverse image search. That is particularly useful for identifying fake images um, that are misattributed, right? The image itself is fine, but it was put in a wrong context. And it turns out uh, reverse image searches, uh, as, as we did in our little infographic, has some usefulness um, to combat visual misinformation. Okay, so other than these two questions, what else can we do in this line of research? Uh, so there are other research themes and topics that I don't have time to cover today, but they are equally very interesting. So uh, one area of research in this area is how do we counter visual misinformation, okay? How do we design effective campaigns against misinformation? And there are two kind of schools of thoughts on this. One is called inoculation. Uh, it's sort of like uh, having a vaccine, right? So inoculation means that you tell people fact-checking information even before they get exposed to something, okay? Okay, so it's like getting a dose of COVID-19 vaccine before you get exposed to COVID-19. And correction um, is something that we do after the fact, okay? So it's more like treatment. So once you get infected with the virus, what do we do? How do we counteract? Um, their harmful effects, right? So inoculation and correction can both be very useful in our battle against visual misinformation. Um, the second interesting line of research is what about specific user groups? Okay, so in this line of thinking, we want to identify a specific user group that are most vulnerable to visual misinformation so that we can target our resources of fact checking, or inoculation or correction towards uh, these specific users only. And then the third uh, um, exciting line of research is to look at specific visual features, uh, for example, color, um, complexity, facial presence, and to see what feature or feature combinations are most indicative of credibility. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge all my um, amazing students and the collaborators, and also the support from the National Science Foundation and Facebook Foundation Integrity Research Award that partially fund the research I presented today. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. And now uh, I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, Cindy, thanks. This was great. Um, we have two questions here, so I'm just going to read them to you. Sure. Uh, how exactly does composition and retouching differ? Mm -hmm. Your retouching example of manipulating a water cannon into a gun, mm -hmm. and it also involves superimposing the image of a gun over the original water cannon. So yeah. I guess that's how, how it's done. Right, uh, so I guess this is, uh, this is a great question, thank you. And I guess um, I, would, I would think the main difference would be 
um, the degree of change. Uh, so in the example of, let's say, a Sarah Palin, um, Sarah Palin's head uh, plus a bikini wearing woman's body, uh, that some, you know, you kind of need extensive change to the original picture by combining two or sometimes three or even more pictures together. Well, I think retouching is more subtle and um, it only affects like a, a little part of the original image. And I would say to some extent, like, um, like zoom, you know, it could retouch your appearance. So that that is retouching instead of, of composition. I, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Uh, another question here, um, and this goes back to the, um, uh, you know, experience equals more skepticism. Uh, mm -hmm. So what constitutes, I think it was a bullet point, what constitutes high internet skills? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so uh, there are scales for those. It's just like, um, you know, so you think of, let's say, um, a personality test, right? For a personality test, uh, usually people would have to like take 30, 40 questions. And then with those questions, they would compute a composite score and then determine, you know, you are, you know, high in agreeableness, low in neuroticism, something like that. So we use a, a established scale of people's internet skills. And the, the scale was actually pretty simple. So what it does, it, it, it has, let's say 20 or 30 um, statements. And then you could say, oh, this is true, this is false. Or I would ask you, do you know the answer to this question? For example, what is an, you know browser cookie? Or I would provide a statement, a cookie is this. A VPN is that Some, something like that. You know, I, I'm blanking on the exact items yeah. used, but this is the generally how it was done. So then we gave this battery of questions to each participant. And then each one would have a score. And that score would determine their uh, digital media literacy. Okay. Uh, we have another one. Um, do you think the research you've done would also line up with deep fakes? Yes, uh, that, that's a great question. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about deep fakes as well. So um, one thing I think that's very much in common uh, is a recurrent theme that people are very bad at detecting forgeries in image. And then with technology such as deep fake, uh, I think we are even more vulnerable. In, in the past, um, as I said, images such as the moon landing, right? Images by default, people think it depicts the true events. Now, more and more people know Photoshop exists, more and more people are using Photoshop, right? So to some extent, people starting to see that, oh, maybe an image is not by default a depiction of true events, okay? But the same thought applies to video even more, right? Because I think video editing software or the software to fabricate video like deepfake is much less available or accessible to the general public that people will still very much think that video oh it must be true okay so to some extent i think deep fake is an even bigger threat than uh fake images my lab has been trying to make some arrows into deep fake and so far our impression is that yes if we are vulnerable to fake images we are extremely vulnerable to deep fakes. Yes. and i think we need we need technological solutions as well as human solutions, um, such as policy change, such as you know laws, to kind of uh, keep the threat at bay. Otherwise, we're doomed. <laughs> um, I had just had a quick thought, kind of technology related to a point you just said there. But like, like our platforms using like. Uh, detection to detect some of these uh, fakes, like are they using like checking for like fake accounts or bots or and stuff like that? Is that happening too? Is that like a tool that they have to 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think there are some technological solutions. Uh, one is to go after the source, right? So Russian Today, for example, we know that it posts dubious stuff. So if it's from Russian Today, then we have to be on high alert. Doesn't necessarily mean that everything that published there is fake. Otherwise, the job will be too easy. I, I think the fake stuff is especially dangerous if, you know, it's published by, an, you know, a somewhat trustworthy outlet, right? When they say if 100% everything is a lie, then actually that's pretty easy. But if 99% is truth and there's 1% of lie, and that's the most difficult challenge there. So I think we can definitely go after the source and there's some um, te technical solutions like perspective analysis, metadata analysis, encryption analysis to directly detect uh, the probability of something being forged. I think I've, I've seen some demonstrations of that, uh, but the trouble is that they are not 100% reliable and not, nothing is. So that puts a lot of pressure on platforms. Um, I think an uh, analogy here is content moderation, right? So let's say, you know, Facebook is trying to prevent uh, child pornography, right? But in that process, it cannot, its AI cannot identify 100%, you know, with 100% precision and recall. It's just not possible. So you have to have some kind of hum, uh, human being, you know, intervene. And that creates, you know, a lot of gray area, uh, lots of space, to, you know, for errors, and then, you know, lots of problems as we've been yes. reading the newspapers and so on. So I, I, I see a lot of similarities between, you know, detecting forgeries and, you know, detecting some other problematic content. Okay. Uh, another question here. Can we prove that spending more time viewing real images allows someone to detect fake images more easily? Does viewing images more often reduce their digital media literacy? So if, if, viewing, if viewing fake images more often, mm -hmm. does that reduce their literacy? So when they're being, you know, bombarded with more fake images, do mm -hmm. they just lose, you know, track of what's real, I guess? I'm not sure. I think that's a very interesting projection. But my, um, I think my hunch is that, um, uh, I, I don't know about images, but my hunch is that with textual information, let's say news stories, if the more you read fake news stories, mm -hmm. uh, my hunch is that the more likely you're going to be vulnerable to more fake news stories. Uh, maybe the opposite is also true. The more you read high quality news stories, maybe you'll develop an appreciation of what a new story should be like, and maybe you can build some kind of defense against um, fake news stories. Because I think they're kind of pretty distinct markers of a good news story, like, you know, very well-researched fact-check news story versus, you know, AI-generated garbage, right? I do not know whether this applies to image, but I think that's a interesting, very wonderful thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, another question here. Um, sometimes misinformation sharing is more about blindly sharing information and being in the trend rather than actual motivation for news dissemination. Yes. What are the ways that can be tackled uh, or what are the ways this can be tackled since mm -hmm. the incentive of badges won't be that driving factor for a user in this case? Um, I, I'm actually not sure. So one thing we are trying to experiment in our current study is badge, right? But as this um, commenter said, maybe badge is not what's driving sharing either. Um, but, you know, I think as, as someone who uses social media, I'd like to share too. What you're trying to get the, uh, from sharing something new and novel is to gain a kind of social currency, right? And I agree, it's not always about, oh, like you should read this, but you know, this has some kind of value, or maybe this is funny or whatever. So I would just blindly share to my followers to gain some kind of social currency. What we're trying to do with the badge is to reverse engineer that social currency, right? What if um, sharing reputable stuff also builds social currency. Um, so that's, that's our attempt at doing that. But uh, I have to admit, I don't know the secret of social currency. I don't, I don't have it all figured out just yet. <laughs> okay. 
All right, great. Well, yeah, that's all the questions here. Um, yeah, thank you again. Really appreciate it. And uh, this talk was was very, very informative. And, you know, it's something that I'm always reading about. And this is this is awesome. I really love this talk. So um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Oh, the, the questions are wonderful. Thank you so much. Great, great. Um, yeah, well, thanks. Thanks again. So um, uh, attendees will we'll be back here next week, 4.30, uh, same time. So uh, um, thanks again, Cindy. Uh, stay safe. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Bye.